people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin the show with the headlines first. Al-Qaeda linked Turkish charity group expanding its network in South Asia. Indian forces step up offensive against pak back terrorism in Kashmir. And European think tank urges UN to hold Pakistan accountable for promoting terrorism. Turkey's links with several terrorist organizations have been brought out by various intelligence agencies time and again. President Erdogan is allegedly using charities as a cover to create network between his government and terrorist organizations. Now, the latest report by a Swedish media outlet has revealed the ongoing jihadi operations of an Al-Qaeda-linked Turkish charity group in South Asia. We have a report. On 18 March 2016, Russia's UN Ambassador Vitaly Turkin sent a letter to the UN Security Council saying that three Turkish organizations sent weapons and supplies to extremists in Syria. The Foundation for Human Rights and Freedoms and Humanitarian Relief was one of the organizations involved. Now the Swedish Nordic Monitor website has revealed that this Al-Qaeda-linked conservative NGO is spreading its wings in South Asia. According to the report, this so-called charity group IHH is running multiple projects in Nepal, especially in areas close to the Indian border. Known as a tool of the Turkish intelligence agency, IHH is working with its regional partner, Islamist Sangh Nepal, in the region. The Kathmandu-based organization Islamist Sangh Nepal is already under the scanner of Indian intelligence agencies for allegedly providing sanctuary to fugitive Indian terrorists in 2018. We also have been seeing the reports uh, from time to time that Turkey, uh, whose leader, uh, Mr. Erdogan, uh, is in fact looking to become a leader of the Islamic world. And in that process, not, not only he is promoting uh, the Islamist ideologies, but also the extremist ideologies in such a way. So we know that they have been operating in Kashmir, they have been operating in Iraq, uh, in Kerala, in different other countries in the world. Um, and here, they in Nepal especially, they have found a good partner, not only in the Islamic Sangh of Nepal, but with the ISI that has been very, very active there. And as you know, that Pakistan and Turkey have a great nexus as far as uh, extremism, uh, terrorism is concerned. So we have to be extremely cautious in that. The IHH receives special funding privileges from the Turkish government, which has backed the Al-Qaeda-linked organization when it faced numerous anti-terrorism investigations in the past. This jihadi group has already been designated as a terrorist organization by countries like Israel and Germany. Ankara is using IHS to expand logistical operations in support of global jihadist networks. On August 16, 2016, a former head of the Turkish police intelligence, Ali Fuat Yilmazer testified in court that the IHH campaigns are designed to provide aid for jihadists engaged in terrorism around the world and supply medical aid, funding, logistics, and human resources for jihadists. Through Islamist Sangh Nepal, the Al-Qaeda-linked IHH is seeking to gain a foothold in the region. The activities of Turkey-based foundation focus on several provinces of Nepal, especially in province number one, province number two, and Lumbini province. It has established mosques, madrasas, orphanages, and Islamic centers in several cities, including the capital Kathmandu. Moreover, the IHH has taken a special interest in places like Sunsari that are close to the Indian border. Nepal government 
has a greater responsibility. They cannot just shirk the facts. We have seen that ISI, ISI was allowed to operate in the country with impunity, which had uh, indulged in several activities against India from the Nepali soil. So that is something that the Nepal government will have to take charge of it uh, and uh, must take it head on before it is too late. Because these groups, uh, once they are, wherever they are, they, that particular place also becomes their biggest target. And Nepal is a peaceful, nice Hindu country, and they should try and contain it uh, uh, on priority. This is extremely important. Turkey has been actively funding and supporting extremist Islamic organizations in South Asia. New Delhi is also very much aware of Ankara's efforts to radicalize Indian Muslims and recruit fundamentalists. Last year only, an intelligence report accused the Turkish embassy in New Delhi of forging unholy association with Indian charity groups and other organizations. Moreover, in the same year, extremist alliance of Kerala's Popular Front of India with Turkey's radical group IHH was exposed by Nordic Monitor. The two key PFI leaders, E.M. Abdul Rahiman and Professor P. Koya, had met senior IHH functionaries. India is now more careful of Turkey's nefarious plans as Ankara's tentacles in India and South Asia are going deeper than thought. Terror financing, radicalizing innocent youths into jihad and launching violent attacks on civilians and security forces have topped Pakistan's list of priorities when it comes to its unwarranted policy on Kashmir. However, to its major disappointment, the alert Indian security forces have been able to foil all their attempts by busting deep terror networks of Pakistan and eliminating and arresting top commanders of terror groups in Kashmir region. Our report. Islamabad's executive wing specializing in terrorism received a huge setback as Indian security forces eliminated Chief of Al Badr terror outfit Abdul Ghani Khwaja a most wanted terrorist in Kashmir's Baramulla district. Khwaja was involved in a number of terror crimes, including attacks on security forces and atrocities against civilians, as well as being the primary recruiter of youngsters into terrorist organizations. We all know that yesterday Sopur had a good encounter in which a former terrorist, Ghani Khwaja, मारे गए हैं। इसका बैकग्राउंड ये है कि 2000 में ये पाकिस्तान गया था ट्रेनिंग करने के लिए, फिर 2002 में वापस आया और पांच साल तक एक्टिव रहा बारामुल नॉर्थ कश्मीर में। उसके बाद 2007 में पुलिस ने इसको अरेस्ट किया, ये जेल में रहा, पीएसए भी इसका हुआ, फिर 2008 में रिलीज हो गया और 2008 से 2018 � ये ओएसडब्ल्यू का काम करता रहा मिलिटेंट के लिए स्लीपर सेल का काम करता रहा और फिर जनवरी 2018 में फिर से ये एक्टिव हो गया 5 अगस्त 2019 के बाद ये एचएम छोड़ के अलबदर का चीफ बन गया लेटर इन अ बिग डेवलपमेंट सिक्योरिटी फोर्सेस एवर्टेड टू आईईडी ब्लास्ट इन साउथ कश्मीर एंड अरेस्टेड फोर टेररिस्ट एसोसिएटेड विद जैश मोहम्मद including a student of BA first year who was being radicalized by his handlers through social media platforms to carry out the car bomb attack. In another preventive operation, police nabbed three terrorists associated with lashkar e taiba who were planning to carry out a major blast at a government building in Avantipura. In the last few days, Avantipur police had two models of police. जो एक जैश का मॉड्यूल है, जैश मोहम्मद एक कार बेस्ड, व्हीकल बेस्ड आईडी ब्लास्ट करना चाह रहा था पांपुर एरिया में, पांपुर हो चाहे एनएच पर, उन्होंने एक साहिल साहिल नजीर, ये पांपुर का है, बीए फर्स्ट ईयर का स्टूडेंट है, इसको बहुत दिन से टेलीग्राम और जंगी ग्रेट्स के इसको थ्रू इसको मोटिवेट किया और इसको कहा गया कि तुम एक सेकंड हैंड कार 
मैनेज करो उसको पैसा दिया और नॉर्थ कश्मीर से एक्सप्लोसिव आना था उसमें इसमें डाल करके इस एरिया में व्हीकल वेस्ट आईडी ब्लास्ट करना था आफ्टर द एब्रिगेशन ऑफ आर्टिकल 370 अ न्यू वेव ऑफ टेरर हैज इमर्ज्ड इन कश्मीर विद इंडिजीनियस फ्लेवर फेलिंग टू इंजीनियर द इनफिल्ट्रेशन ऑफ टेररिस्ट अक्रॉस द लाइन ऑफ कंट्रोल पाकिस्तानी एजेंसीज हैव रिसॉर्टेड टू सोशल मीडिया प्लेटफॉर्म्स लाइक ट्विटर टेलीग्राम एंड फेसबुक to radicalize and recruit kashmiri youth they are indoctrinating youths and influencing them with false narratives and enticing them to take violent paths besides providing them arms ammunition and other resources for spreading violence meanwhile the common names of terror organizations active in kashmir like the lashkar-e-taiba jaish-e-mohammed and hizbul mujahideen are gradually being replaced by new ones like the resistance front lashkar-e-mustafa ghaznavi force and al-badr most of these groups are old wine in a new bottle with the majority of the cadre being locally recruited however their operational and financial control remains with their bosses in pakistan uh, like we saw in case of pulwama they always pakistan is always ptv and isi uh, they always try to say that everything happening in kashmir is because of our own home grown issues and no foreign agency or no foreigners got any role to play which is of course a very uh, uh, is a lie which everybody understands so these are probably two two factors firstly to uh, keep that chain which links pakistan with such terrorist uh, to disrupt it and secondly to give it a face of home grown militancy social media is now the preferred tool firstly it is cost effective secondly it is not bounded by any geographical limitation sitting in karachi sitting in islamabad sitting elsewhere or in london anywhere you can float a thing and it comes out to people in valley and the person who sees it a young mind he sees it as a normal person would see anything and when he shown videos which are actually picked up from middle east lebanon and things happening elsewhere syria and then shown as as if happening in kashmir so after 2 3 4 such instances and then you know there is a scientific uh, way of doing it people who are doing it they are doing it as per a scientific program so the observer or the watcher he starts believing it and he gets subverted frustrated with ongoing development and peace in jammu and kashmir pakistan is using all the tricks in its book to incite terrorism in the region although most of its moves have either failed or backfired Vigilant Indian forces have thwarted almost all of their ill designs. A significant number of terrorists have been eliminated while many others have been apprehended. According to the Indian government, there was a significant reduction in terror incidents in the Union territory in 2020 in comparison to 2019. 244 terror incidents were reported in Jammu and Kashmir in 2020. in comparison to 594 in 2019 while 221 terrorists were killed in 2020 in comparison to 157 in 2019 till february 2021 15 terror incidents occurred in the union territory in which eight terrorists were killed while terrorism is on decline successful encounters are on the rise so uh, it happens because of how i look at it two things firstly a terrorism can only survive as long as it has a uh, popular uh, local support so this is one indication that uh, people in general are moving away from these people secondly security forces network is becoming more strong and uh, uh, the technical uh, thing which has now been incorporated whether it is visual on the border uh, line of control or surveillance through social media and other other tools that is now paying dividends Pakistan which has lost its credibility in the global arena due to its constant support of terrorism is somehow trying to convince the international community that it is a country that is working towards peace last month india and pakistan agreed to observe a strict cease fire along the line of control meanwhile on the security front things are only deteriorating several new terror groups have emerged in the union territory Terror infiltration bits from Pakistan also increase as summer begins in the Kashmir valley. And now Pakistan backed terror groups have been adopting and adopting terror tactics from other theaters like recruiting and radicalizing local youngsters, drones to drop weapons, tunnels for smuggling 
and introducing sticky bombs in Kashmir. This puts a question mark on Pakistan's intent as to whether it genuinely seeks peace at the border or it is hatching a bigger conspiracy and peace gestures were merely a tactical move. Every time Financial Action Task Force meetings loom on the horizon, there's a flurry of Fox anti-terrorist activity by Pakistan. Symbolic arrests of terrorists are routinely conducted. After observing such farcical steps of Islamabad, a European think tank has urged the United Nations to hold Pakistan accountable for harboring terrorism. We have a report. <laughs> In November 2020, Hafiz Saeed, the founder of the Lashkar e Taiba, received a 10 year prison sentence in Pakistan. In January this year, Lashkar e Taiba operations commander Zakir Rahman Lakhvi was arrested nearly five years after he was released on bail in the 26 11 Mumbai attacks case. These were just to showcase actions by Pakistan ahead of possible international actions. There have been scores of instances in the past when such actions were taken, but terrorists always got away scot free. The entire world understands Pakistan's songs and dance routine to cover its sponsorship of terror. Islamabad is being exposed by different international organizations at various global platforms. While urging UN to hold Pakistan accountable for promoting terrorism, Amsterdam based the European Foundation for South Asian Studies has exposed Pakistan during the ongoing 46th session of UN Human Rights Council. In 2019 to 2020, following growing diplomatic pressure from the FATF and seemingly not driven by a genuine attempt to combat terrorism, Pakistan arrested Hafi Saeed and Zakir Rehman Lakhvi, two UN designated terrorists. These sham arrests exemplify Pakistan's double-edged approach towards terrorist activities. Terrorism is patronized when strategically useful, but opposed when it targets Pakistani interests. Various terror organizations have continued to receive the military's patronage and unstinting support in Pakistan. Terror operations of LET and other jihadi groups are coordinated with the inter-services intelligence that provides it with intelligence and logistical support. Moreover, Pakistan Army and the notorious ISI help these terror groups in identifying specific targets. There has been some actions against some of the groups by Pakistani establishment, but the ones that have been deemed anti-Pakistan. FSAS also raised the issue of an unholy alliance of Pakistan Army with terrorism. The current situation is a natural outcome of the well-oiled infrastructure for terror created over decades by the Pakistani army and its intelligence agencies, and Islamabad's consistent distinction between good and bad terrorists. To be clear, the strategy has yielded no benefits for the political and economic well-being of Pakistan and the wider region. Until the Pakistani army abandons this deeply entrenched way of operating, however, this situation will not change. Most of the terrorist groups in Pakistan were created by the Pakistani state to serve its own purposes. However, its ability to control the various terrorist outfits is uneven and some of them have turned against their creator. Unless Pakistan makes a strategic shift in its approach of not using these terrorists in furthering its interest in the subcontinent, it will continue to pay a price in terms of human lives and economic loss. There have been many bloody wake-up calls and there have been many half measures. But to win battle against terrorism, Pakistan needs to go the whole way. Moving on. It's been more than 70 years since Pakistan through illegal and immoral means of trickery and thuggery occupied the present-day territory of POK and Gilgit Baltistan. Ever since, it has been using these regions to propagate extremism and terrorism. Despite several warnings from the international community, terror launch pads are operating in full swing in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, where terrorists are receiving training on cross-border terrorism and infiltration by the Pakistan Army, a report. 
Pakistan occupied Kashmir continues to be safe haven for terrorists and extremists operating in the country. The land over which the people of POK have their prerogative is blazingly being used to establish and proliferate terror camps. Not one or two, but a large number of terrorist camps thrive here. The gullible youth is indoctrinated in these camps only and then asked to infiltrate and unleash mayhem in neighboring countries, especially India. At one side, amid international pressure, Pakistan government pretends to launch a crackdown on these terror groups. On the other, terror leaders in Pakistan continue to carry rallies and hold meetings openly. حکمران جماعت یعنی پی ٹی آئی کا ایک جلسہ تھا راولا کور سابر شاہی اسٹیڈیم میں تو وہاں جتنی بھی کالدم تنظیمیں ہیں ان کے مختدر جو لیڈرز ہیں اور کارکن ہیں ان نے شرکت کی اور بھرپور طریقے سے شرکت کی تو اس کا مطلب یہ ہے کہ پی ٹی آئی جو ہے وہ اس بات سے کنوینس نہیں ہے یا موجودہ حکومت ہے کہ یہ کوئی دہشت گرد ہیں ویر ایز کے ورلڈ کمیونٹی جو ہے وہ ان آرگنائزیشنوں کو دہشت گرد تنظیمیں قرار دے کے ان پہ بینڈ بھی لگا چکی ہوئی ہے اور پاکستان جو ہے وہ ایک طرف عالمی اداروں کے اندر یہ کلیم کرتا ہے رپورٹ کرتا ہے کہ ہم نے دہشت گردوں کے انفراسٹرکچرز کو بھی ڈسمینٹل کر دیا ہے After being cornered by international community for its increasingly active role in terrorism, Pakistan had made tall claims of tracking down at terror facilities. However, Kashmiri voices across the globe have refuted the Pakistani claims of fighting terrorism as a bogus exercise and say that all the camps are intact and in fact are being provided with constant reinforcement to keep their agenda thriving. ایک طرف تو حکومت کے جو ٹال کلیمس ہیں کہ ہم نے دہشت گردوں کا کا جو ہے وہ بیخ کنی کر دی ہے پاکستان کی سوسائٹی میں تو ابھی بھی جو ہمارا ہمیشہ سے دعویٰ رہا ہے کہ پاکستان میں جو ٹیررسٹ گروپس ہیں ان کا جو انفراسٹرکچر ہے وہ سٹل انٹیکٹ ہے اور وہ ابھی وہ لوگ جو دہشت گرد تنظیموں سے وابستہ ہیں وہ کھلے عام دن دناتے ہوئے جو ہے نا وہ گلی محلوں میں گھومتے ہیں With limited educational opportunities, the region has dismal literacy statistics and unemployment is widespread. They do not have even basic facilities at their homes. The resources of the region are exploited with impunity and no amount of share is returned to the people of the region. If demanded, they are subjected to supreme high-handedness of the state. Pakistan administration has also restricted media reporting from this region. Anybody who wants to stay and interact with the people of the region must have permission from the interior ministry of the country. بعض ایسے ایریاز ہیں کہ جہاں نہ تو میڈیا آپریٹ کرتا ہے اور نہ ہی ان کی خبر جو ہے وہ کسی میڈیا کے اندر آتی ہے جیسے آزاد کشمیر ہے یا گلگت بلتستان ہے یہاں جب لوگ مار دیے جاتے ہیں ان کی لاشیں کسی نالے سے یا کسی چوک چرائے سے برامد ہوتی ہیں تو یہ اس کو جو رنگ ہے جیسے ہم جس کو شہید قرار دینا چاہیں تو اس کے لیے ہماری دوسری زبان ہوتی ہے اور جس کو مردہ قرار دینا چاہیں تو اس کے لیے الگ ہے اور جس کو بیرا رو انسان قرار دینا چاہیں تو اس کے لیے بھی ہماری ایک الگ زبان ہوتی ہے لیکن میں یہ سمجھتا ہوں کہ ابھی بھی پاکستان کے اندر جو ٹرانسپیرنسی ہے واقعات کے اندر وہ نہیں آئی ہے چونکہ میڈیا کنٹرول ہے Demonstrations and protests have become a common sight in the region as people are compelled to come to streets for numerous issues 
that remain unresolved by the administration. Ever since Pakistan invaded the region more than seven decades ago, it has meted out a second-class citizen treatment to the people of the region. In most of the citizenry plights, the government is either complicit or culpable. It makes tall claims of granting these people rights at par with the normal citizen of Pakistan. However, the fact is that these people are deprived of even their fundamental rights. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shreya Savijay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.